मंत्री थी Did you know that Spotlight On is completely self-funded by the team that produces it? We're always looking for ways to keep the podcast self-sufficient without sacrificing the listener experience or the integrity of the show. The best way we could think to do that was to ask for the support of our listeners. Please consider making a donation to help cover our annual operating expenses. Go to spotlightonpodcast.com and click the word donate. If you can, please do. If you cannot, please don't worry about it. Just continue to enjoy the show. We're happy to have you as a listener. Thanks. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today, the spotlight is on international award-winning harpist and composer Kirsten Agresta Copley. Kirsten, who is known for her charismatic, telegenic presence on stage, is also the go-to harpist for pop artists including Jay-Z, Beyonce, Stevie Wonder, Enya, The Roots, Lady Gaga, and many others. Kirsten joins us to talk about her recently released New Age album, Aquamarine, which is inspired by, quote, her deep connection with the ocean and imbued with memories of her late mother. This album is a heartfelt homage to the woman who ignited Kirsten's passion for both music and the sea, end quote. Kirsten spoke with us from her home, which is also a commercial recording studio in Brooklyn, New York. Please enjoy our talk and stick around after the end credits to listen to Into the Mist from Kirsten Agresta Copley's album, Aquamarine. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Are you in that beautiful studio that I see in the photos online? Yes, I am. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I mean, either, well, I guess it could be two things happening, but I was going to say either the studio is absolutely stunning or you have the best photographer in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be a little bit of both. I mean, photographers both. always do their job very well, too. But no, the studio is absolutely incredible, and I feel very fortunate to have it in my home and for others to, to be recording here as well. So Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So it doubles as your home? It is, yes. We have a townhouse in Bushwick and we got renovated the bottom level of the home to be a full working tracking studio. So we have a live room, which I'm sitting in right now, and then there's a separate control room. Even the last track on my new album was recorded live with the two strings, with the cello and wow. the violin, trio style, in right in this room that I'm sitting in. Wow. Obviously, we're together today to talk about that album, but I wonder if maybe I could put any further exploration of that on hold for a minute, just to talk a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and that kind of stuff. You're in Bushwick now, but where'd you start? Where are you from? I grew up in a suburb of Detroit called Bloomfield Hills. It was a lovely place to be musically and all else <laughs> because there were a lot of amazing school, revered youth orchestras, which I was a part of, and a pretty burgeoning music scene as well. So mm -hmm. great place to grow up. How does one come to be introduced to the harp? I, I have this stereotypical sense, probably from my own experience of you know, kids get introduced to piano or kids discover guitar, but how does one have a harp placed in their hand for the first time? Or how does one become seated at a harp? Whatever it is you do to <laughs> play that. I think everyone has a different story if you ask them that as a harpist. But as you mentioned, I, piano was actually my first instrument. My mother was very integral in my musical aspirations and my further career. She actually started me on the piano when I was 18 months old. And she sat me on her lap and taught me how to play fine middle C and to play some very simple pieces as a very small child. <laughs> and then subsequently, we had a lot of really unusual musical instruments hanging around my house because she was interested in all of them. She was a musician as well. And a harp made its way into my home. It was a small troubadour harp, which meant that it was more of, of a folk instrument with levers instead of the grand concert harp that you would see in the back of an orchestra. She really bought it for her own enjoyment, but it turns out that her precocious, curious child <laughs> at five years old decided that she really liked it too. <laughs> 
And the rest is history. She found me a teacher locally, which was the principal harpist with Detroit Symphony at the time. It just blossomed from there. Do you remember what attracted you to it initially? Probably that it was the first new thing that that was in the living room. And I think I always wanted to try out everything that was at my disposal, so to speak. It was really like a playground for me musically because there were recorders and guitars and a guitaron and a marimba. And I mean, just all sorts of different things, you know, violin, a flute. I mean, it was just <laughs> endless entertainment for a child. I think the harp was definitely the most unique of them and also the most challenging. And I think that I wanted that or maybe unknowingly desired that challenge. Were you and was your mom, were you the type of people that could pick up any of those instruments and get them to make a usable sound? Yes, absolutely. I was always bitter about those people. I, I always struggled <laughs> just to just to stink. <laughs> And playing in bands and stuff as a teenager, there's always that one person that can pick up any instrument and get a functional melodic sound or what have well, you. Well, I will say, it. I'll say functional sounds. I don't think I could necessarily make a career out of all of them. Well, that's okay. <laughs> certainly, that's certainly, you know, there was a limit as to what I was able to do on a lot of them. But, but the piano and the harp both were primary instruments for me when I was growing up. If we could just detour for a moment to talk about some specifics around the harp, because I don't want to assume there's certainly limits to what I know, but I also would like to, on behalf of listeners, help them a little bit understand about the harp. Could you talk a little bit about the mechanics of playing the harp? And by that, I mean, I think that most people who listen to this podcast understand the piano as a rhythm and melody instrument. They understand even visually how most instruments work. I don't think it's immediately obvious to the untrained eye what's going on for a harpist and the maybe dexterity or concentration involved. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about functionally and mechanically, how, how does a harp do what it does? Well, that's a great question. And I think it's funny how many people come up to me when I'm performing and say, what are those pedals for at the bottom? Most people assume that they're similar to a piano where you have a sustain or a soft pedal and they're nothing like, like that. There are seven pedals at the bottom of the harp. Each one corresponds with one note of the scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And there's three levels to the pedals. So when it's in the highest level, it would be in flat. And if it's in the middle level, it would be in natural. And if you push it all the way to the bottom, it would be in sharp. So each pedal corresponds with its note in every octave of the instrument. So if you press the D pedal, all of the Ds will change to flat or sharp or natural based on where you're moving those pedals. Then there's pedal rods that go up. I'm motioning to the side like you can see the harp that's sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, there's pedal rods that go up the column of the instrument, and those attach to 2,000 moving mechanisms within what we call our neck of the instrument. So it would be the curved top part of the harp. And those mechanisms turn and move the nuts and bolts that are attached to the string to make this thing work. And there's 2,000 pounds of pressure on the instrument. So it's, it's a very complex and sometimes very finicky instrument. Weather affects it definitely with humidity. The wood loves the humidity. The strings do not. So the strings are made of three different materials. The, the bottom wire strings are wire. The middle octaves are gut. And the top octave is usually nylon. And so the gut strings just can't stand the humidity. <laughs> and on changing cusp seasons, you know, you have a lot of breakage and you just really never know when a string is going to break. So we have to be armed with an entire set of strings at all times. So you string your own instrument? Oh, yes. Yes. And it has to be tuned every day. That was my next question. So you tune it as well? It's not like a piano where there's a tuner? No, I'm the tuner. <laughs> wow. We each, we each tune our own instrument, yes. And it's similar to a piano in the sense that it has a tuning key that attaches to pegs. 
but that has to be done every day because those strings really do fluctuate up or down. If it's cold, they will tighten and they'll be sharp. If it's warm, they will loosen and be flat. I think there, there's a very famous quote that says, harpists are tuning half the time and playing out of tune the other half of the time. <laughs> something, to that, something to that effect. Yeah. And it's very true. <laughs> I love harpist humor. <laughs> I probably didn't even say the quote right, but it's something to that effect. And it gives, it gives you the idea. <laughs> Certainly. You mentioned the way the pedals work and the way they set the natural or flat or sharp. So is that essentially before you're playing a piece, you know the key of the piece you're about to perform in. So you set up for the next piece as you throughout a performance? That's right. That's right. And then as accidentals happen during the piece, you would be moving your feet to change those pedals for the accidentals as the piece is going along. So it is the most similar, I guess, to a pipe organ in the sense that your hands and your feet are moving, I mean, for in different ways, obviously, but the feet are employed the same way that the hands are. And as a touring musician or as a performing artist, do you bring your instrument or is it like a piano where you will just go to the local Steinway and they'll bring you a, a piano? Like, do you have yours that you bring with you? If I'm within driving distance of a performance, then absolutely I would rather play on my own instruments because, as you can imagine, you never know what you're going to get when you rent an instrument. But I was just playing in Oklahoma a couple of uh, two weeks ago, and I had a wonderful instrument that was given to me by the university to perform on. Yes, I do rent them when I do out of town or overseas gigs specifically. It's a crapshoot, certainly. And it, like a pianist, you have to be able to adapt to that instrument immediately yeah. and to be ready to perform on it. When you say within driving distance, what does that look like? Like, is the harp like shoehorned into a Prius or is it in, in the back of a U-Haul? Like, what, what do you, what's, what's driving <laughs> a harp around look like? I have a Subaru Outback. So a plug okay. for Subaru. <laughs> <laughs> And it, and it fits very comfortably in the back. Not with much else, I'll add, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and my final question about the, about the instrument itself, like with a Steinway or a Yamaha or a handful of other brands, is there a harp that a classical harpist aspires to own or must own? You know, is there a specific maker that is the one? I'm particularly fond of the Lion and Healy harps. They're based in Chicago, Illinois, and I have two, two of them that I absolutely adore. My first harp was a Salvi, which is also most of the parts are from Italy. And then there's a German company called Horngocker that's also very esteemed. It really is about personal taste. Each of those lines has a different voice. And I think within those voices, each harp that they make is different. So for instance, the harp that I'm sitting next to right now was ordered in 2006 and I had them special order it because of the color that it is. It's black and bronze and that's not in their usual line, but they actually made two of them for me and I flew to Chicago and tested them out on their soundstage and chose the one that I felt was the superior instrument. It's really a very unique process, I think, and also a very personal one. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Can you tell me a little bit about your classical training and specifically what I'm interested in? When I talk to musicians with a classical background, I tend to get one of two versions of a story. And one is that they were so immersed in their training and the repertoire that they didn't really have experience with other musics until they're maybe adolescent or young adult years. And then there's other people who had basically the diametrically opposite experience, which was they were always surrounded with a lot of music. And I wonder if you fall into either one or some yet unnamed third <laughs> version of that story. I think I fall into the second, actually. I was surrounded by a lot of different music when I was growing up. And I started studying with the professor at Indiana University in Bloomington when I was 11 years old. So her name is Suzanne McDonald, and she's revered in the world as one of the foremost harpists. She's been my mentor for 
practically my entire life based on when I started studying with her. And my parents were very supportive, driving me back and forth from Detroit to Bloomington once a month for lessons. And then subsequently, when I was in high school, I actually flew to New York City and studied with Nancy Allen at Juilliard for two years. It was the same situation. I would hop on a plane with my mom and we'd, we'd fly to New York and I'd take a lesson and sometimes we'd fly back that same night back home. I really had a pretty amazing education and in terms of my classical training, and I felt like I was in exactly the right places to do that with those two professors. Aside from that, at college, I was also singing, so I was part of a group called Singing Hoosiers, and we toured and recorded with the Cincinnati Pops and did all sorts of really fun stuff. I, and I was always interested in pop music. I wasn't necessarily going to the listening library and turning on classical music. I was putting on headphones and listening to whatever was popular on the radio a lot of times. And that, I think, carried over into my professional life now, given all of the backup work that I've done with pop artists across the board with a very wide range of, of, of genres. What would you say was some of like your first music that you chose to consume as opposed to as part of your training or that was there in the house because someone else put it on? What were you going towards? Well, my earliest memory was probably of owning the first ABBA records. <laughs> Good stuff. That was probably probably my, my earliest memory of buying a record and being really into it. But I had the Beatles and Journey and all sorts of different music. And then Subsequently, I started getting really into the ambient music. In the new age, I, became, I was really fascinated with Enya, you know? Mm -hmm. Enya was on loop when I was in college. And then after that, I became really well aware of Brian Eno and all of the amazing work that, that he's done. And The Pearl, which is one of my favorite albums of all time, it's the collaboration he did with Harold Budd, or one of them, I should say. And that's by far one of my one of my favorites. But I'm also a huge fan of Peter Gabriel and world music. Do you think that your training on the harp prepared your ears for ambient music? Not necessarily. No, I think that I discovered the ambient music primarily for stress relief and anxiety. And most often I would listen to it on an airplane when I'm flying, trying to block out everybody else around me, but also to center myself and focus on a flight. And then it kind of expanded to me wanting to learn more about those artists and diving deep into their catalogs and listening more. How do you feel about, about genre as it relates to your recent work? I don't think it would be necessarily provocative to say that the term new age could be loaded for certain people, could be derogatory to certain people. None of these terms are universal, obviously, or none of these impressions are universal. And it comes in and out of vogue stylistically or how the public perceives it. And I wonder, especially in the material that I received as I was preparing for our time together, new age is certainly not a term you shy away from in the descriptors of your music. And I just wonder what thinking and feeling do you bring to that or what sort of musical baggage, good or bad, do you bring to that? I don't feel like there's any baggage associated with it. New Age music to me is something that is tranquil. It's peaceful. It gives stress relief. It can provide people with a sense of time for themselves and mindfulness. And those are all things that I require for myself as well. So I think that I was drawn to it primarily because within the composition of pieces, I wanted to try to shy away from a more classically driven album and find space within the music. I think there's a lot of beauty within the space. And it's hard, I think, for a classical musician who's used to playing a lot of notes and this, you know, this, this repertoire that demands so much from us technically. And these are not difficult pieces in that way. They're meant to be relaxing and accessible. And so from that perspective, 
the soundscaping that goes that surrounds them is part of that full package, of course. And that's what makes it new age. But I don't find that to be necessarily a derogatory term. And I feel like the people that listen and appreciate my music fully embrace the fact that's what it is. I've always been concerned for artists that do create under that genre is that there's a certain section of the audience that at, at their own loss self-selects themselves out of new age. You know what I mean? I, I, I've often thought that as soon as the, an artist picks up the ambient label, they sort of get some audience back because, <laughs> because there's a, let's call it a hipsterism or whatever it is. I, there, I, I'm not articulate enough this afternoon, <laughs> but um, there's some element of, oh, I'll listen to an ambient album, but I won't listen to a new age album. And it could be the exact same album. We just put a different sticker on it. <laughs> well, because my music tends to be a little bit more melodic, I think that it is ambient to a certain degree. And some of the songs on this particular album are more ambient than they are new age. So there's a little bit of a combination going on there. I don't know what to say about that, except that I hope that listeners will find what it is that moves them and speaks to them through the music. I do as well. For most artists, I mean, genre is such a difficult thing, and it's difficult to talk about oftentimes with the creators of the music, because as I'm sure you know, some artists reject the conversation entirely and others are very aware that like they're within a tradition and they're very happy to be in that tradition and it's what they've devoted their energy to. It's, I think, a complex topic for a lot of musicians and listeners. It is. And I can understand that there's perhaps a not necessarily positive feeling towards New Age if you're thinking about certain artists that you find a little woo-woo. But I think it also expands it has it has a wide range and a wide breadth. And I think that's part of the joy of discovering the new music within it. I don't know if this assertion is true. And I also, I'd be curious to know if you perceive this at all. But my sense also is that it's more of a generational hang up than anything else, because there has seemed to have been in the last 10 or 15 years, a rediscovery of a lot of the early electronic music artists, synthesizer music artists, outright early new age artists, and they are not treated at all as novelty or looked down upon by a younger, newer audience. And I wonder if it was just, again, generational wrapped up in sort of that late 80s, early 90s new age movement thing and got put in the bathwater with that baby. But other people who didn't experience that don't have the baggage. I think that's right. And certainly what comes around goes around <laughs> and, yeah. and old things become new again. I think young people also are under a lot of pressures that possibly older generations didn't necessarily have. They've lived through a pandemic. They've lived through what or are living currently through climate change and things that are affecting their future and their daily lives in, in some really impactful ways. And I think some of those kids are listening to this kind of music because it calms them. That's amazing if that's what it, if that's what it does for someone. Yeah. We'll be back with more Spotlight On after this break. If you like what you've heard so far, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. For past episodes, web-only exclusives, and to join our mailing list, Visit us online at SpotlightOnPodcast.com. And now, back to Spotlight On. Tell me about the genesis of your new album. And again, especially with instrumental music, to read about the intention and perhaps the narrative behind instrumental music is something I actually very much enjoy. And again, some people don't like to deconstruct it necessarily. They'll let the music speak for itself. But I know you've introduced some of the narrative around this work being inspired by some shared interests with your mom, as well as the inspiration and support she provided you. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what was day one at the beginning of this project and where did you start and why? Day one was writing Into the Mist, which is ironically the, the last, last song on yeah. the album. It was born out of the 
growing knowledge that my mother was disappearing off of this mortal coil. It was a difficult time. It really allowed me to express the emotions that I was having, which varied from day to day through music and through these compositions. So each one kind of came along during about a two-year process. I've made it an homage to her. She passed away in January, so it's an homage to her because she was the foremost supporter of my musical career. But we also shared this beautiful affinity for the ocean and for its conservation. I've just collaborated with the I Am Water Foundation in South Africa and Cape Town. It's amazing to be able to use this music also to bring awareness to that cause. But I think the cause was born out of the time that she and I shared near water. I grew up in Michigan. It's the Great Lakes state. My mother, as a side note, was Miss Michigan 1957. And one of the wonderful things that she was able to do during her reign as Miss Michigan was to cut the ribbon for the Mackinac Bridge, which connects the lower peninsula to the upper peninsula of Michigan. And being up north, visiting Mackinac Island and Traverse City, where she was born and raised, picking up Petoskey stones and trying to find them. They're very elusive, and it's a whole trick to try to find them in the water and then polish them. That was, you know, when I was very little, those are my first memories of being by water. But then we had shared experiences on holidays going to Florida to visit my extended family for Christmas and New Year's. And we would take long walks on the Gulf of Mexico and pick up shells and share stories about life and love and really bonding over those moments. So I think that was really how that became part of my story with this album. Were you able to share any of the music with her? No, I was not. And none of it had been recorded before she passed. So right. I'm hopeful that somehow she can hear it on the other side, but... <laughs> That's fair. But no, she, I, she knew that I was working on this, on this project, but she was never able to hear it. When you talk about the two-year compositional process, what does that look like for you? Do you sit down with pen and paper and write? Are you recording pieces? What's your compositional process or what was it for this project? For every project that I compose for, it's pretty much the same. I have an amp and a guitar pedal called Eventide Space that I hook up with my pickup. That is what allows me to compose the pieces in a manner where I can hear the decay of where I need to leave the space after something is ringing. How long do I want to allow that to ring? Where do I want it to move harmonically? All of that is executed through that improvisational process. It doesn't mean that I'm sitting down every day and have a job with it, so to speak. It comes to me when I feel like I have something to say. I can read a poem or see a flower, or, you know. I mean, anything can be inspiration for it. And if that happens, I try very hard to at least leave myself a voice memo and sing it into my iPhone. But a lot of times if I'm at home, I'll just go straight in there. And even if it's just two measures, I'll open up Finale and get it in there. And then I'll come back to it and see, oh, that wasn't very good. Let's, let's try something else. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or, hey, that's amazing. And let's see where that can go. I think the two-year span was also during a time when we had just moved back to New York City. We had a seven-year hiatus, I call it, where we, we lived in Nashville, Tennessee. And we moved back in, in 2021 during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> when everybody else was leaving. <laughs> yeah, we should, we're, we say that we swam upstream. <laughs> you know, we were the outliers coming back instead of leaving. But that was this was home to us, and this is where we knew we we belonged, and we came back for that very reason. But within that time, we were also building this studio that I'm sitting in, and lots of other things of readjusting to living in a different borough too. We lived in Manhattan when we were here before. Oh, really? Yeah. And for 18 years, I lived in Manhattan, and now I'm in Brooklyn, so that's a whole new, <laughs> new thing. 
But there were a lot of things that tore me away from record, not recording, but from composing. So by the time I had all of these pieces compiled and was ready to record, it had been a long, a long journey. Were all of the pieces composed before you pressed record the first time, or did you compose any of it? Was there such a discrete separation between composing and recording? No, we recorded all of the pieces in one chunk of time. They were all composed and ready to go, but no, no pressing of record until, until all of them were lined up and we had sessions in place. One of the other things that, that struck me, so curious about this, given the personal nature of the material and your story around this album, the fact that to a large extent, if you allow me to say it broadly, it's a solo work, certainly compositionally. I wonder what role a producer plays uh, other than yourself. I, I was very, I don't want to say surprised, but I was sort of taken that there was producer credits on the album for someone other than you. I, I'm just so curious about what role that person and people play on a record like this or a project like this. I think that that person wears many hats. They're very immersed in the recording process. They preview all of the music, make sure that it's listened to and making sure that the mastering is correct. Wearing the hat of also helping promote marketing, being my pick me up on days when I don't feel like things are going so well. So they functioned as a producer would on wasn't a unique role given the nature of this project. It was oh, no, no. I think a producer is a producer, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and my producer has been a very big supporter and integral piece of the puzzle. How I got this misconception or idea in my head, I, I don't know, but I had this notion that this was a very self-contained initiative on your part. I had this vision, especially after I saw the recording studio, I had this vision of one person feverishly doing everything? Well, no. Um, I had a recording engineer that was separate from my husband, who usually is the engineer <laughs> in our studio. But I had a separate recording engineer that came in to record this album. My mastering engineer is the same one that I've used for my last record, Around the Sun. And I loved her work, so I used her again for this project. The collaborations, I think, were the most fun for me too, in a sense, because I mentioned that Into the Mist, we were able to do that live in this room. And it was incredible to feel the energy from the other musicians while we were playing together. And it inspired the cellist to say, hey, I have some ideas for over overdubs for the cello part and played these gorgeous colors and tones that made the record, you know? and they're mixed in. It was an interesting development, and I think a natural progression for me to start to think about adding other instruments into my work, because most of the body of my released composition are solo. Yeah. So this is new for me, but it's also one that I'm really appreciating and probably will do a lot more of. Yeah, I was going to ask you, does, that, does it strike you as the beginning of perhaps a next phase or the beginning of something you want to do more of? I think it certainly could be. It would be difficult to talk about this record without talking about the Sonics. It's a beautiful, beautiful sounding record. And between that room you're sitting in, the mixing and mastering engineers, it's, it's really stunning. It's, it sounds beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, you get the sonic range of the instrument. I would actually say for anyone who's not familiar with what a harp can sound like, or if they have an idea what they think a harp sounds like, to hear it in such a wide open landscape is really something else. It's so beautiful. That's something that is, is very dear to me, is the soundscaping. And that is done by my husband, Mark Copley. <laughs> He's a very talented engineer that has a lot of unique and vintage in some cases outboard units and he also has some tricks and i call it ah. his secret sauce that i never give away <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's there's a lot that goes into it and it's multi-layered and a lot of people think that there's there are keyboards 
and that somehow those soundscapes are created by some sort of, you know, keyboard effect. And I can tell you there is 100% no keyboard <laughs> on any of my albums. All of it is done by the crafting of that mixing board. Are you multi-tracking? No, there, there are not overdubs in terms of the harp either. There might have been one or two where there was something high that I couldn't play at the same time that I was playing something low, you know? So I take that back. There might have been an overdub or two of the harp, but no, truthfully, most of them are recorded straight through and what you hear behind them is all about the mixing. That's great to know because when I, the first time through that I listened to the album, I did not look at the, the packaging and the credits. And I had a very similar reaction. I was like, there, this can't be one instrument. <laughs> Especially earlier in the album before it was obvious there were some other collaborators. But there were points where I was like, it was almost like a synth pad sound, like just a, this ambient swell that was underneath some of it. And really crazy. Wow. <laughs> But there was just a blog that came out that said, when the piano and the other instruments come in, and I, I wrote back, no, 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 <laughs> you need to edit that. That's not accurate. There are no pianos. There are no other instruments. <laughs> it's just the harp and the, oh. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for not already having the answer to this question, but can you tell me, do you perform this material live? I can. It will never replicate the album in its raw form. But because of that space pedal, I do have the ability to program the pedal to at least give me part of what you would hear. And to be honest, that's what I write with anyway, so I'm comfortable using that in a live setting. I was doing a lot more of that live performance when we were doing online concerts, and I could set up in my own home and do that. But I'm equally as comfortable doing it in a public setting as well. So. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about something you alluded to earlier, which is the fact that you perform with a lot of different types of artists, especially in varying pop idioms. Tell me a little bit about that aspect of your career. I mean, I would imagine there's an element of a working musician works and as a craftsperson and a trades person, that's what you do. Can you talk about it from a satisfaction point of view or an enthusiasm and excitement, a, a music lover? What itches do you scratch by, by, by taking on that kind of work? A lot, a lot of, a lot of itches are scratched, if you want to put it that way. I find those experiences to be some of my fondest. And there's no question that I will say that playing center stage at Carnegie Hall is a once in a lifetime, amazing, amazing opportunity that I'm fortunate to have had. But I will also say that playing with Beyonce at the White House for President Obama is a close second. <laughs> doesn't suck. That doesn't suck. <laughs> no, and each one of the artists that I've worked with have had a very different feel of how they are as an artist, how their performances are, what my responsibility is within the context of that performance. But they're all really fun. <laughs> and I have, I have nothing bad to say about any of them because it's an experience that is just so out of the box and so different from what classical artists usually get to do. Yeah. And I've been really fortunate to have had a, a pretty balanced, eclectic career in that way. I wonder, do you ever get a call from an artist or an artist's representative and have the reaction of, I wonder how, like, how do I fit in with this? Or how, do, how does my instrument fit in with this? What's that experience like when you know Beyonce wants you to perform with her? Do you know what's going on? Like, how does, what's your experience? I think actually the Beyonce gigs made perfect sense. The ones that were a little harder to figure out and they were the first experiences were with Kanye West. And my very, very first gig was playing at Live Aid, which was the 10th anniversary of Live Aid. And we played in Philadelphia on the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum. And it was incredible because there were a million people in front of us. And it was strings and harp packing him up. It was, it was an, a unique, uh, unique entry, if you will, to, to that world. 
of hip hop specifically, which I subsequently did quite a bit of after that. We were part of a group called Wired Strings and they're based in London and they hire a group of us here in New York to do a lot of these, a lot of these performances and gigs with artists. And there were charts written for me. You can hear music behind in the samples of hip hop music. A lot of times those are what are turned into the actual arrangements for the strings. And the harp always seems to be the one that does the glisses or whatever. But I had a really cool experience playing with Jay-Z where we were on break at Carnegie Hall and they were playing back a track and I heard a little quiver that happened within one of the samples. My harp was plugged in. You could hear it all through the Carnegie Hall to the top of the rafters. And I just played this quiver at the top of the harp. And they, the whole team, including Jay-Z, just turned around and went, what was that? And it made it into the show. So occasionally I get to put a little of my own, <laughs> my own ideas into these experiences, which is cool too. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. One more quick question before I let you go. And if I'm putting you on the spot, I might actually ask if I could follow up with you about this one. But are there a couple of pieces, whether it's your own or classical repertoire or anything else that you would recommend to someone who is now interested and says, geez, I'd love to hear more of what the harp and a harpist can do? Well, I'd be happy to send you a couple links. <laughs> that would be wonderful. That would be well. We can include them in the show notes. We'll include them in sure. the show notes. Sure, yeah. I would be happy to do that. I think there's yeah. some really interesting music that's out there right now. And I think that there are many different harpists doing lots of different unique things with the instrument. So it's a versatile instrument and it's underutilized. And I think that's something that we all need to shed light on as musicians. Is there much repertoire in the classical realm written for the harp or is the harp mainly an accompaniment instrument? No, we have a pretty substantial standard rep that, that we have for us to study. Obviously, you can tell it's the, it's the edge of my, my knowledge as far as music goes. But. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for spending time. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really enjoyable. I appreciate being on the show. Thank you so much, Kirsten Agresta Copley. And as always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host and executive producer, Lawrence Purrier. We're produced and edited by Michael Donaldson with theme music by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. For past episodes, web-only exclusives, to make a donation to support our production, and to join our mailing list, visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch.